The U.S. doesn't support a two-state solution, it just supports saying it does. Notes from the Edge of the Narrative Matrix. The U.S. doesn't support a two-state solution, the U.S. only supports saying the U.S. supports a two-state solution. We know this because the U.S. just vetoed Palestine's bid to become a full U.N. member state after lobbying other countries to vote against the resolution, despite continually saying it supports the foundation of a Palestinian state. Washington's words say one thing, but its actions say the opposite. This is because if the U.S. admitted its actual position, it would greatly damage its reputation on the world stage. What the U.S. actually wants is the same thing the Israelis want, for the Palestinians to go away, or lie down and submit completely, or otherwise stop being an inconvenience until they're a forgotten footnote in the dustbin of history. But the U.S. can't come right out and say this, so it pretends to support a two-state solution that Israel has spent years doing everything it can to ensure never happens. It's a completely fictional resolution to a very real problem, but the alternative to supporting it is to admit you support continued apartheid, oppression, ethnic cleansing, and genocide. So the U.S. maintains this ridiculous charade where it keeps pretending to support this fake non-solution even while taking concrete actions which make it clear that it does not. Immediately after vetoing the Palestinian bid for UN membership, Deputy U.S. Ambassador to the UN Robert Wood declared, the United States continues to strongly support a two-state solution. This vote does not reflect opposition to Palestinian statehood, saying the emergence of a Palestinian state can only come about through direct negotiation between Israelis and Palestinians. We can see right now how things are going on that front. As always, the only way to understand the U.S. centralized global power structure is to ignore what its officials say and watch what they actually do instead. This is good advice for understanding geopolitics and government dynamics in general, and it's good advice for sorting out fact from fiction when dealing with any manipulator in your personal life. Ignore their words and watch their actions. The Washington Post put out a good investigative report on the IDF's murder of six-year-old Hind Rajab along with her family in Gaza earlier this year, showing that evidence points to Israeli forces being behind the attack. Washington Post editors immediately shit-coded this report by giving it the obnoxious headline, Palestinian paramedics said Israel gave them safe passage to save a six-year-old girl in Gaza. They were all killed. This headline is carefully crafted to suggest that Israel kindly granted safe passage to Palestinian healthcare workers who were then killed by some unknown assailant. Imagine going through all the work of putting out a hard investigative report and then having your editor slap that shit on it. Disgusting. A senior U.S. Air Force leader and whistleblower has informed Congress that the U.S. is refusing to pull its military forces from Niger despite being told to do so by the new Nigerian government, and that refusing to withdraw troops from a nation where they aren't wanted is putting them at risk. Which means we've got another illegal U.S. military occupation on our hands. It's so stupid how everyone's felt the need to keep pretending to believe the Gaza death toll has legitimately hovered around 30,000 for months now just because Israel supporters have been calling the official death count a Hamas-driven exaggeration. We all know the Gaza Health Ministry hasn't had the infrastructure or ability to count all the dead throughout the Gaza Strip for months, and that the official number doesn't include people killed by starvation and disease due to the Israeli blockade. But because Israel supporters, including the U.S. president, threw shade on the health ministry's numbers from the beginning, they succeeded in dragging the Overton window all the way down to this ridiculously conservative estimate just through sheer vitriol and denialism, even though we know the killing never stopped. Ralph Nader wrote in early March that the real number is probably more like 200,000. There's no good reason to discount this. It's certainly more likely than the number just continuing to sit around 30,000 for no reason.